believe it or not, this is not actually as complicated as you might think. The newer versions of this are significantly more intolerable. This is right in my wheelhouse right here. morning well it's a little bit afternoon I keep forgetting that hot coffee exists actually let's turn off this fan above my head here all right today we're going to work on something on the bus um, they've noticed it's been a few days since I've published anything yeah my neck is still a thing you may be able to tell the way I'm moving around it's a little bit obnoxious but Remember a few videos back, I can't remember if it was its own video or not, but we installed an interlock bypass circuit on the bus here. Because right now, if I turn the key for the ignition, it won't start from the driver's console. I mentioned it a few times here and there, but I'm pretty sure what happened was when we installed the solar panels, there is a ground wire up there and I think one of the side marker lights or the clearance lights up above on the side of this thing had one of the ground wires get messed up by a lag bolt going in. I did manage to find some schematics for this thing without buying them on eBay. Um, somehow they randomly appeared. So what we're gonna do is take a look at these schematics. We're gonna do a couple of quick mods as it were and see if it makes a difference. And the nice thing about this is I can do, I think, pretty much all of it sitting right here in my chair. Because at the moment, transferring is not a thing that's going to work. So anyways, I'm going to finish drinking some of this coffee, get a little bit of breakfast. And then we're going to jump right into this. I've got the schematic right here on my screen. No idea how long this video is going to be today, but uh, this is something that's been grinding in the back of my brain for a while. I can start the bus just fine with that interlock switch in the back. But uh, it would be nice to have that not required, not to have those extra steps to do it. Okay, breakfast, I'll be back. I apologize for just pointing this camera at a screen instead of using screen capture. But anyways, this is what we're doing right now. After much digging around, I found some schematics and I believe these two circuits right here are our problem. We have the road relay lamp, and then if we scroll down further in another spot, there's a headlamp relay and a bunch of other stuff. But what we're gonna do is I've traced down, so they have these numbers here, and I've traced down this circuit to post number 15 and 16 on the master, well, the front driver's side master junction box. Um, this is the decal that's in there and basically post 15 and 16 are tied together. Half the stuff on this is 24 volts, half of it is 12 volts. The circuit we're looking at is 12 volts and they run independent grounds on everything in this bus because of all the dissimilar metals and expansion and contraction, whatever. Anyways, all that being said, we've got all of our clearance lights here. The intermediate marker lamps are the ones where I'm pretty sure we have the problem because the ground for the front clearance lamps is nowhere near where we install the solar panels. But these two right here are somewhere in the middle and they rely heavily on diodes and surge protectors in all the wiring on this bus. Like you can see diodes all over the place here. And if a ground gets disconnected um, or if for some reason power gets shorted to ground, which I don't have the wiring locations. Anyways, it can cause all kinds of problems. I spent a bit of time trying to trace this out and where it's pulling power from the 24 volt bus over here, or the bus bar, and then we've got the headlamp relay. Um, I, I think what we're gonna do here is basically go outside to that panel, open it up, and we're gonna disconnect the wire that feeds all of the overhead marker lamps on the outside. What that will do, I think, is if we have a ground problem up there with one of those, grounds can backfeed into all kinds of crazy areas and are super unpredictable, especially when we've got a bunch of diodes and stuff going on. 
sometimes you can blow out diodes and surge protectors, but first step I'm gonna take is just to disconnect that, come back in here, turn the key, and see if anything's different. There are a couple of variables here because those two pins are tied together. So I'm gonna leave them linked, but we're just gonna pull off the one wire that feeds all of the marker lights and see what happens. In theory, if it's a bad ground or if something is shorted up there, the fault should be cleared and we should be able to just start the engine. The other thing I found is when the headlights are on and the engine is running and you turn off the key, the engine stays running until you turn off the headlights. So that told me that we've got a floating ground somewhere or some sort of ground leakage or some sort of alternate path because there's a few relays in, in here that handle both 12 and 24 volts on different contacts at the same time. So anyways, enough yapping. Let's go out there and turn some screws and uh, see what happens. Okay, this is gonna be a little bit hard to show because that thing's really tall and I'm really short, but there's one of our marker lights right there and we've got the front ones up here. What I've noticed ever since we installed the solar panels is the front ones don't work anymore. I can't remember if that one was working or not, and there's another one on the other side, but the solar panels basically go from about right here to about back there. And according to all the information I could find online, all of the wiring runs down the inside of the bus on the driver's side luggage rack then goes up into the metalwork in the ceiling and crosses over to this side. Now there's only three grounds in the entire system for all of the marker lights, and two of them are up here in this region. So it's a little bit odd that the front lights don't work. So there's a few different possibilities here. Either we shorted the power feed to ground, completely cut the power feed, or we cut one of the ground connections. Either way, it's gonna cause weird problems all the way throughout. So let's go around front here and take a look at the distribution box. And of course the ground's a little bit muddy, but hey, what are you gonna do? Inside this magical region right here is one of the mini distribution blocks for this bus. And what we're looking for here is pin 15 and 16, which should be tied together. And the cool thing about this is every single circuit is labeled. So, okay, we've got two coming off there. I think, well, this BL806 right here, this is our feed that's going up to all those uh, marker lights. We do have another wire coming into it here. I believe that should be the feed from the 12 volt bus bar, which I believe is somewhere else. So what we're gonna do is loosen up this stud and pull off this giant wire right here and then see if anything changes. Actually, first off, I'm gonna hook up the multimeter and just check for shorts because the other, the other issue here as well is if we did short something out, we could have potentially blown a fuse or a diode or if it's only a partial short, it could be causing some sort of other issues. But this is a 14 gauge. Now the manual said it was 14 gauge, it looks bigger than that. But anyways, uh, let me grab the meter real quick. Okay, so everything in here is still very much powered up at this point. I just wanna do some checking here and see if we can find anything super obvious. I think what we wanna do here is check from right here to ground. Let's see, where's a good ground? Maybe here? Okay, interesting. We have, according to the beeper on the meter, a direct short to ground. Which doesn't necessarily mean anything because we do have some light bulbs and stuff up there. Although right now it's turned off and okay, I'm rambling. I, I don't know. I'm pretty sure the switch. Yeah, I don't know if the relay is on the output of this or the input. So anyways, I'm going to pull this nut off right here. We're going to pull off this wire and then see if it clears our short. Once again, this is still not a super accurate way of deciding that, but we need to take it off anyways, so yeah. So I don't necessarily recommend doing this stuff with everything powered up, but I do kind of, oh no, the whole stud's spinning. Okay, there we go. None of the 112 volt AC system runs through this particular board, so I'm not worried about getting shocked. Then let's pull, oh, put that down. Let's 
pull this guy off of here. I've got another washer there. Now that that is all completely isolated, let's check and see if the rest of that circuit is going to still have that, air quotes, short. Okay, it does. Not too big a deal. This one does not. That one does. Uh, yeah, we need to look at the schematic a little bit more to see what's going on there. Um, I'm going to go back inside and print out that schematic. I wasn't... Well, there's a bunch of labels here and I can't remember what they were. I don't know which one of these is the feed. Oh wait, that goes to a giant contactor. Oh. Well, we're on the right, hang on, I'm gonna print this off, I'll be right back. Okay, simply because the driver's console is right here next to the printer, that post 16 does power up some other stuff that has to do with the stop lamps and turn signals and some other things. I didn't want to power it up just because the D-Deck and ATEC control systems monitor like things like the reverse lights and there's a light on the dashboard for the stop lamps and all that. But I think since we're right here, I'm just going to turn the key real quick and see what happens. I don't know if it's a good idea or not, but we're going to try it. Okay, let's turn this on. Stop lamps light is still on, that's good. All of our normal lights are on, so let's bump the starter and see. Okay, nothing. Uh, did we turn on the headlights? Okay, something's happening. The buzzer changes ever so slightly when I bump the starter. Hmm, interesting. Okay, according to this, we're on circuit 808, and... Oh, that's the gauge of wire, 10 versus 14. So 10 is our main feed, and then the 14 gauge one goes out. Oh, is this our ground right here? Hang on here. So this here, I think is what goes out to our marker lamps, and it goes into a sheathed cable that has, well, there's a few things that pile in there. But there's a black wire coming out. Let's see where this goes. It's got a connector on it. Uh, let's see. I have not been able to find a grounding chart for this vehicle yet. Um, hmm. Well, regardless, we're gonna hook our feed back up because that controls some other circuits. And this here comes straight from one of the big contactors over here. So let's go ahead and reattach this. Okay, our main power feed is now disconnect or is now reconnected. In theory, this here should be where oh there's our label. This is the 806 or 808, I couldn't quite tell. It's either 806 or 808. It's the same on well that's bright. It's the same on here. Um, I'm going to stare at this for a couple more minutes and see what I figure out. I got my terminology a little bit confused here. So there's marker lamps and then there's clearance lamps. Marker lamps are these ones like right here and those do not currently have a problem. It's the clearance lamps that do and it appears as though, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yeah, seven of those have it share a common ground. Okay, now that I know that, look at some other stuff. So there is a problem with trying to figure all this out. I'm just guessing that when the solar panels were installed is when the problem started. I hadn't actually tried to fire up the engine about a, for about a week before the panels were installed, and that was the only thing that had changed. Now in something like this, an older vehicle that has had problems with water leaks and whatnot, like that front junction box, which we're actually gonna take care of right now, has a lot of corrosion and stuff in it. And also, the plastics on the dash, maybe even the ignition switch itself, there's so many different things that could be causing the disconnect between turning the key all the way up here and having the engine start 45 feet back this way. So, I'm just kind of 
using my analytical electrical skills, I guess, to try and figure out things that might be related. All that being said, we're gonna kill the main power to the system right now, and I've got a can of deoxit here and a toothbrush. Here is the chassis battery compartment. We've got a big, it's kind of a combo unit. It's a battery balancer and also a 12 volt step down converter because a lot of stuff on this uh, coach <laughs> runs on 24 volts and some runs on 12. So this thing basically pulls 12 volts off of one of the two batteries and also keeps them equalized at the same time. By the way, 8D batteries. Do not screw around with these things, they are very dangerous. Regardless, we've got two halves here. There's 12 and 24, so let's go ahead and uh, shut everything down. And now we're gonna go back up front and uh, I have a surprise. Supplies, look at these grounds. Um, doing any sort of troubleshooting when you have grounds that look like that is probably not gonna get you anywhere that you wanna be. So we're going to deoxid the crap out of that. And then also we have other beautiful things like these relays right here. I think these, I can't remember what they're for, but that, um, yeah, something. So I have absolutely no idea if we're gonna fix this problem today or not, but there's a few things in my mind, like with the clearance lamps and whatnot, that I wanna rule out. And I am not opposed to just running a wire from up here all the way back to my interlock bypass in the back. The problem with this bus is it was not originally built from the factory to have a wheelchair lift, and one was added later. So that kind of screws up some of the interlocks and things. Technically, it's supposed to be a neutral high idle with the engine running and the brake on for the lift to work. But when we were driving this thing back from LA, we found out that the interlock switch on the lift door would affect the transmission being able to shift into fourth gear. That should not happen. <laughs> um, so there's also throttle limiting, throttle limiting circuitry in this thing for reverse. And I feel like somehow that wheelchair door was affecting that. So regardless, we're just gonna poke around here. I'm gonna get some of this cleaned up as much as I can. And um, yeah, so I'm gonna do some stuff and then I'll be back. At this point, I'm gonna have to say I don't know. I've gone through here and any connection that looked remotely corroded, I cleaned it up, pulled the cables loose, sprayed some deoxid on there, cleaned it with the toothbrush. This one 40 amp relay right here did have a loose connection on it. Didn't seem to get hot. There is a main power feed wire here that's like a uh, two gauge wire that looks like it got really hot at one point, but it also looks like they were trying to move it around and the connection hardware is weird. So I think what might have happened was it was powered up and they moved that and shorted it out on something. I think everything looks fine though, near as I can tell. There is one blown fuse that is labeled lighter. I don't always trust labels on stuff like that and this was explosively blown. Other interesting note, this bundle of wires right here goes up to an auxiliary uh, cigarette lighter right next to the driver's armrest. So I'm thinking that the existing lighter had some sort of wiring issue and they put in this aftermarket one because uh, yeah, the, this this is a very explosively blown fuse. <laughs> so anyways, I think at this point I'm gonna let all the super flammable stuff that I just sprayed in there dry for a while. Then we're gonna power this back up and see if anything changed. The thing that gets me though is leaving the headlights on and turning off the key, the engine stays running. And also some of the marker lights don't work. Now I do know that the front ones used to work. I have seen those. So something with the lighting circuit and the interlocks or the connection between the start key position and the engine is funky. I still don't yet have a full set of schematics for this thing. I've just got little bits and pieces here and there that I've been able to find. but. Anyways, for right now, I'm gonna let this dry, then I'm gonna power it back up and see if anything's changed. I'd be highly surprised if anything's different at this point, but, um, oh. I do very much need to replace these two relays. I took this one out and I was cleaning the contacts, and one of the pins broke loose from the plastic housing, 
the wire inside was still connected to the pin, so I very carefully put it back in here, but I do need to get a couple of new relays and mounting blocks to replace these two. These are the worst out of everything in here. All this stuff over here, all these grounding points and whatnot, some of them are just flopping in the breeze. Other ones are actually mounted down, but I was able to get all those cleaned up. I do need to get the air compressor over here though and blow out some of this silt that's in here. There was an issue with um, water like running down the side here and puddling up in here. I've, I've since fixed that, but yeah, and this, this little um, post breakout board or whatever, I loosened and cleaned a bunch of stuff there too. So anyways, um, like I said, I don't think we've fixed anything, but if nothing else, I feel a little bit better knowing, well, that one 40 amp connection being loose kind of freaked me out. Um, it wasn't loose enough to like heat up, but still, I don't like seeing things like that. And then also, you know, this bus is from 1994 and it's had a number of owners. So we, we get a bunch of extra wiring like this. And it's interesting, some of this, some of this wiring actually has labels on it, which is strange. So I, I don't know. I checked all these random hanging fuses and stuff too. But anyways, what I need is an actual electrical location diagram. I've not been able to find that. And the guys on eBay that are selling the manuals and schematics don't even have these traditional schematics in them. So I don't know. Whatever. I'm gonna I'm gonna let this dry. Then we'll we'll see what happens. Okay, let's re-engage the knife switch, then we're going to scurry back over there and take a look at things to make sure nothing funky is going on. Hello, electrical box. Uh, don't see any puffs of smoke or anything. Not that I was expecting them, but I always like to double check that stuff because you never know on something like this. This thing's been owned by so many people and so many mods have been done. And this is just one of seven electrical boxes like like this on the chassis. There's there's so many of these things. Luckily though, um, they're they're all about they're all about sitting height that side. I'm just sitting here in my chair, and I can reach this just fine. So, anyways, let's go inside and see if anything changed. And the other problem with diagnosing and fixing a lot of this stuff, or even just working on this beast in general, is I have to have a functioning wheelchair lift, and. It's powered from the chassis. So there's only so much I can do before I have to turn the power back on. Um, anyways, I always enjoy a challenge. Key on. The buzzer changes ever so slightly when you hit run, but nothing happens. Well, anyways. Um, huh. Uh, who knows? Okay, now this is super duper strange. I went ahead and turned on the clearance lights. The key's off, headlights are off. These should not be working. Um, yeah, that one's on. All of our lights up there are on. License plate light. Very dim running lights. All of the markers on this side, except for the middle ones. The middle and the front clearance lights don't work still. I know the front one's used to for a fact. That one's on. Not smelling anything getting warm. This wire being disconnected should be preventing that. Huh. That is confusing. I am noticing on this main lighting contactor though, that there is this extra wire that does not appear as though it's factory, or at least the position of it. And, ooh, that. Oh! Okay, so interesting side note. Right there, if we look, that wire has been abrasing, has some abrasion on our 24 volt bus bar. But check it out. That goes into this, and that buggers off back into the body. I think that might be our clearance lights right here. I think someone bypassed something. Um, let me be careful because this is powered up. But yeah, we've got 
can't quite, uh, can't quite, I'm not gonna stick my finger in there. I can't quite see if there's more than one wire going into that or not, but interesting. Okay, so I do have a pinout for this contact or what it's supposed to be. Let's go look at that. I was just reminded of something else. I came back here to grab a beverage. That light is glowing. That's one of the only other circuits in the roof that potentially could be affected by lag bolts being driven through. That's not supposed to be glowing like that. On camera, it looks full brightness, but to my eye, that's barely on. Okay, I, I, I'm i going more with the, we, we've got a bolt sticking through something in the ceiling that it shouldn't be. Um, this, this little harness hanging down right here was for the bathroom in use sign and the uh, door latch and some other stuff for the bathroom, and that runs through the ceiling as well. So, okay. I, I forgot about that component. That's making me think more now that it is a problem with bolts being driven through the ceiling. Okay, that was remarkably awesome. I just, hang on, let me set this tripod down, trying to hold things. I decided to just call MCI and ask them like, hey look, I'm trying to find wiring locations, stuff like that, blah, 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 whatever. I get their tech support, some dude answers the phone, I tell him the year of the bus, told him what was going on, he's like, oh yeah, all those white wires on the bottom of the driver's side front electrical panel, those are the grounds for everything. And I was getting the idea that because this bus is built from so many dissimilar metals, I mean there's aluminum, steel, stainless, and some other weird alloys, that they can't use chassis grounding for everything. He said every ground for every system that has to do with lighting and anything inside the bus is all of those little corroded bolts and white wires that I preliminary, preliminarily cleaned. And also, the wires that run to the marker lamps and even back there to the bathroom, all of those are inside here. He's like, just pull down a speaker grill, you're gonna see a few wiring harnesses. He said when they go up to a marker light, you'll see like, so I think the side, well, clearance lights, side clearance light is about here. So I think I need to pull off this speaker grill right here. And he said, you'll see where they go up and into the wall. So how crazy is it as a guy in a wheelchair living in a bus that can't stand up and get to everything, all of the wiring is reachable. The only bits I can't reach is from like right here up to that clearance light. But to be honest, I would just be perfectly happy with clipping the wire to that light and not having that marker light. Um, he said though that the issue with the engine not starting should not be related to any of those other circuits. He did admit that ground loops are an insane thing. He's like, but what you gotta do, he's like, mark every single one of those wires so you know where they go on those little grounding studs, pull every single one of them off. With the engine running and the headlight switch on, turn off the key, he's like, and get a good solid ground and just check each one and eventually he said, you'll hit one and that engine will shut off. As I'm editing this, I realized I left out a major part of that conversation. So as I'm talking to the guy on the phone, I was like, what I really need is the manual that explains where all the wiring is. He's like, oh, that's easy. If you want, I can just tell you the locations. And I'm like, confused. There's only three spots that wiring travels in this coach. I feel like I'm saying the word bus a lot, so I alternate between coach and bus. One of them is under the floor in the two main rails that is shared for the HVAC. That's all the high power stuff, airlines, high amperage battery cables, all that. Nothing to do with what we're working on here. The second is right behind the driver's window. It goes up that B pillar and basically from there into the bottom of these luggage racks. The wiring does not go across the ceiling anywhere back there. The only spot it does is in the front, right in line with that B pillar. It comes up, some of it splits off down this side. The other half goes up and over the top and into the luggage rack on this side and then down here. So at no point behind the driver's console are there wires in the ceiling anywhere. So that means we did not hit anything with lag bolts putting the solar panels on. This is where I like to come back to explaining diagnosing problems. You start with the most simple possible thing and work your way up from there. Now, when I worked for a major auto manufacturer in their shop, I did drivability issues, which gets charged a rate that's double, sometimes triple the normal shop rate, because it's very technical, very complicated, and 
usually schematics and scan tools are not going to help you because the things are just so strange. So I'm used to jumping in far down the road on a diagnostic project and all the basic simple stuff has already been done. Here comes the wheelchair card. Starting simple would be taking apart that dashboard and checking the back of the ignition switch. There's clearly a bunch of weird wires hanging down back there and in the electrical panel. People have been screwing around with things and whatnot. Here's the problem. I can't pull any of those panels off unless the batteries are disconnected. And if I go outside and throw that switch to disconnect the batteries, I can't get back into the bus because the wheelchair lift doesn't work. So, I guess I just need some help to track that down. Um, because getting in and out, it, well, yeah, it, it makes sense. I need electricity to get in and out, and if there's electricity, I can't be in here when I'm taking that apart, because danger, Will Robinson. Um, so anyways, it was awesome being able to talk to MCI. I wasn't even on hold. I called him up, I pressed the option for tech, dude man answers the phone. He seemed excited, too. <laughs> He's like, oh, I assume you're building a motorhome, right? I'm like, yeah. I was like, I'm leaving all the luggage racks and stuff in, so that's fine. I'm not modifying anything necessarily but uh yeah solar panels are not related just a random thing that happened to happen happened to happen so anyways um so i think what we might have going on here is a uh a triangle of weirdness i don't know what else to call it usually coincidences i don't believe in them so he said, yeah, anytime we work on anything, especially in the older buses, because, well, uh, check the grounds. He's like, that's the first thing you do. You pull those out, you clean them out, you put new studs in. Um, that's before you do anything. He's like, those grounds are what you mess with. Interesting note too, um, and he confirmed this, about a year and a half after this was built, this thing's from 1994, it was like halfway through 95, somewhere into 96, they went to a multiplex wiring system on these things. And that made things a lot more complicated and everything interferes with everything else. But it makes sense with how much wiring is in here. But yeah, okay, so I, I'm super happy now. I, I can just pull down these speaker grills here, get to all the wiring looms. I think what we're gonna do first though is, because I just sprayed some deoxid on those things and loosened the nuts and kind of wiggled them a little bit. And that's not the proper way to deal with corroded things. So, yeah, we're, we're gonna go get some pellets right now because I need to do that before they close. I mean, it's only 2.30 at the moment, but I need to get that done today. And then we're gonna pull every single one of those ground studs off, label all those wires so I don't actually lose any of them, bundle them together, take all those connectors off. I've got a bunch of new ring terminals so we can replace some of those. And he said also some of the studs break off and then the grounds are just floating in space, which I think I showed two of those earlier. So anyways, we have a plan of action now. Let's go grab some pellets for the, uh, for the, for the, this here thing. Let's see if this thing is gonna run. This is what we use to pick up pellets. Okay, it started, that's a bonus. We got the little puff of blue smoke that the modular engines always do. Um, yeah. Okay, so you may be wondering, Dan, why is the green van running and why are you about to drive it? Well, that was the issue with this thing. It does technically need an engine, but it will run and drive. Enough so that I actually put new tires on the front and replace the battery. With the issue that it has with the crack in the head or the manufacturing defects or whatever, it does still run and drive, but it uses coolant quite a bit. And there's a massive oil leak that is starting. So for right now, this thing works really well as a storage unit. There you can see that the Traeger barbecue wheelchair thing is in there. And it'll make it the 10 mile trip, well, 20 miles round trip to the supply place to get pellets and come back. And the convenient thing is I can just leave the pellets inside the back and park it right here next to the bus. That way I don't have to worry about storing the pellets and moving them around and stuff. So just drive out there, we get a bunch of bags, put them in the back, and then I just pull them out one at a time as I need it every couple of days and uh, yeah. Boom, someone's your aunt and or uncle. I haven't yet figured out what I'm gonna do about this van. Engines are still not available for it. Um, so, I don't know. For right now, just using it as storage and pellet acquisition. 
but I, 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 I just don't know what to do. Um, the other van works great for now, but it's, I mean, this thing's got less than 110,000 miles on it. It's in pretty nice shape other than that stupid engine. So eh, stuff, I don't know. There's about 45, 50 bucks per pallet in profit. I always wondered with these things, cause you gotta ship them all over the country and like- Cause I, I burn them and I don't, I still pay a little over $5 a bag myself. Yeah. And that's, and that's basically, and that's, that's right at cost. Interesting. It's $55. It's the last ones we brought in was a little right at 50, $54 a pallet on shipping. Yeah. That, that, that just, adds up. That was oh. just the shipping and we bring in there's that's 30 and we bring in 30. I just unloaded a truckload of that's 30 tons of 30, 30 tons of load. Yeah. So, you know, 30 times $55 is, is the shipping. It's a strange new world we're living in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See you, man. And, ta-da, we have pellets. So these 12 bags here, depending on outside temperature, will last me maybe three to five weeks, something like that. If it's above 40 degrees outside, they last a lot longer. Below that, it seems to be a pretty crazy break point. But if it's 50 degrees or above outside, each one of these bags will last me about three days. So anyways, um, perfect spot to warehouse these things. Now, as I need one, I can just come out here and grab it every few days and uh, we're good to go. So what does all this mean? Um, I'm not really sure, but after talking to that technician and him assuring me that there's absolutely no way that a floating ground, a shorted power to ground on the ground wire or a shorted power to chassis, like electrical problem anywhere in the lighting circuit could have anything to do with the key on or the start function not working. I forget how I started that sentence. Anyways, he said they're not related and there's absolutely no possible way that they could affect each other and that these grounds are always the first thing to check. So seeing as how we know that this wire doesn't actually control the marker lights because the marker lights still work when that's disconnected and it's actually this wire we're gonna put this back together. I'm kind of done right now for today, I think. Uh, with all the new information that's floating around in my brain now, I'm gonna let my subconscious kind of uh, churn on this and see if I come up with anything while I'm asleep. Even though we don't have a positive result of repair, I still feel like I've accomplished a lot in the sense that now I know how these systems work, where the wires run, and also, let's see, I think it's three eights. Anyways, with all the new information now and knowing where the wires actually run and all that, I think what I'm gonna do is pull apart a couple of the, I'm gonna be really careful with these. Oh, oh, oh hey, that's not what you wanna have happen on a powered up distribution board. Um, but anyways, I'm gonna pull apart some of the interior luggage bay access panels like under the speakers and stuff over the next couple days and see if I can't figure anything out. But for right now, I'm gonna order some new relays here. I think these things are ungodly expensive and it's impossible to get these things on eBay that are actually real. Uh, these are the Potter and Brumfield like proper relays. I think they're maybe 65 bucks each. So I might have to get them from like Granger or somewhere. Probably one of the online retailers, not, not Master Car. I'm trying to think of the other ones, electronic suppliers. Anyways, I'm gonna get the model numbers off these, get these ordered up, because these need to be replaced anyways. I think one of them has to do with AC and the other one has to do with charging maybe. Regardless, we're gonna put all this back together. We're gonna put our tools away and then I'm gonna go inside and there's another brainless project we're working on. Well, not brainless, but anyways, I'm gonna button all this up, then we'll reconvene inside with um, some other fun things to work on. Oh, my chair just went to sleep. You ever reach down and go to move and see the little Z's on the screen and then it, you have to, okay, anyways. Okay, I lied. We're not working on another project in this video. I am working on something, but we'll save that for later. This one's getting long enough. There's at least another 30 minutes of footage I filmed. 
I went through and took care of those ground studs, cleaned them off, changed all the connectors out, uh, regrounded a bunch of things, came back in here, turned the key, still no change. So I think like I was saying earlier, I need to start at the beginning. I'm gonna have to get some help here that can disconnect and reconnect the batteries for me. And I need to take apart the dash and check the wiring in there. Um, the basics are always where you want to start. I, I think I kind of jumped in at the deep end here. But anyways, for now, um, once again, I still can start this thing. It does run and drive. I just have to use an interlock switch that I installed in the back. Link to that, link to that video above, by the way, if I haven't already mentioned that. And uh, yeah, I think we're going to call that good for now. There's uh, got some other stuff going on here. We got the Portland International Auto Show coming up. I think it's February 2nd through the 5th. And that's what this little project over here was for. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm planning on being there every day. So if you're in Portland and you want to come say hello, um, look for the wheelchair vans. I don't know what the name of the company is this week. Um, they keep getting bought and sold and the name's changing. But yeah, I'm going to do a live stream there as well because auto show. Last year's was super dumb. I hope there's more stuff going on this year. But yeah, so we're going to do the live stream at the auto show. I don't know what day it'll be, but... And I'm going to be there, so if you want to come by and say hey. Um, yeah, so I think that wraps it up for this video. Um, oh, I forgot. Never say that wraps it up for the video unless you're actually done. About my neck and stuff, I did hear back from my doctor. I, 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 I'm never sure if I've said it in a video or if I've been talking to other people or what, but the short version is I had the EMG done. They didn't check my neck, but then the doctor said they did and I don't know what's going on with it. Um, right now, I'm just going to ignore it until things get significantly worse. I'm fine sitting in my chair. It's about 7 p.m. right now. Usually by about four or five in the afternoon, I, I feel pretty good and my range of motion mostly comes back. But when I lay down at night, that all goes away. So still trying to figure that out. Um, have I ever ranted about healthcare before? and doctors. Anyways, now the video's done. Thanks for hanging out. I'll uh, see you guys tomorrow on the live stream. Uh, yeah, anyway, that was my my neck and mobility. I haven't uploaded a video on a few, whatever, rambling. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a good one. We'll just assume that a black screen means something good is happening.